start today with our land acknowledgement first, which is that the Archaeological Research Facility is located in Wichin, the ancestral and unceded Chechenyo speaking Ohlone people territory, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the art community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and a race living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold University of California accountable to the needs of all American Indian and indigenous peoples. And there's various ways we can do that. Uh, but today we are uh, really happy to have Dr. Rita Lucarelli, um, who is going to be speaking to us on her recent work. Um, she is, in fact, in the Department of Middle Eastern and Languages and Culture, where she is an associate professor of Egyptology and the class of 1939 chair in undergraduate education. So well done. Um, she's also a curator, a faculty curator of Egyptology at the Phoebe Apperson Hearst Museum of Anthropology and a fellow of the Digital Humanities here on campus. She's presently working on a 3D model of ancient Egyptian coffins. So we're looking forward to seeing that. Uh, working on a book of the dead in 3D, as well as a new monograph on demonology, scary, um, in ancient Egypt entitled Agents of Punishment and Protection. Ancient Egyptian Demonology in the First Millennium BCE. So she obviously teaches a range of courses on Egyptology, but this course she's talking about today that's at San Quentin State Prison, which is just across the Richmond Bridge, uh, is through um, the Mount Tamil Pious College, uh, which will probably tell us something about how that works out. Uh, so today she's gonna tell us about an Egyptian concept, mat, I'm probably not saying that correctly, and how teaching about that in prison is um, probably very engaging and informative. So please welcome Professor Lucarelli. Thank you, Christine, for the nice introduction. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, we have a small light to read. I'm happy to be here. Oops. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if I can be Okay. Well, I can do a light with my laptop, with my. <laughs> okay, got the light. Don't worry, Nico. It's fine. This should be enough. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm happy to be here to present uh, my teaching activity at St. Quentin State Prison. And uh, St. Quentin uh, uh, is the oldest prison in California, as probably most of you know, built in 1852 in the San Francisco Bay to replace a shift that served as California's first official prison. And uh, St. Quentin has been notoriously infamous, an infamous place where the use of torture as interrogation technique was banned only in 1944 and home to the large death row population in the United States. In uh, 1969, oops, it's not really changing. On the screen. Oh, okay. In 1969, it was also here that country music legend Johnny Cash sang the crowds of incarcerated men, St. Quentin, you've been a living hell to me. In 2022, Governor Newsom announced the dismantling of death row at St. Quentin, while the space it occupied will become a positive and healing environment, quote, according to the Newsom administration, which wants to rename the facility San Quentin Rehabilitation Center. In fact, San Quentin Prison is already offering a number of educational and rehabilitation programs for its incarcerated population. And in 2021, I was given the opportunity to join one of them by becoming part of the faculty of uh, 
uh, Mount Tamalpais College, the first accredited junior college in the country uh, based behind bars. Mount Tamalpais College Associates of Arts degree in liberal arts. It's a um, multidisciplinary education that offer introductory courses in the humanities, social science, uh, math, and science. To, to earn the AA degree, students must complete 61 semester units, so 20 classes across a range of subjects, and most courses are uh, introductory and lower division uh, uh, and are transferable to four-year institution. The college serves about 300 students, uh, students at a time, which is a small portion of the over 3,000 incarcerated people housed at San Quentin. But the enrollment is capped around 300 because of uh, limited classroom space. At least 3,731 students have taken courses through the program over the years. The humanities program includes a number of courses on uh, world history, history of California, history of American government and the like. The focus on the history courses has been mainly for modern histories with a glimpse into the ancient world through two of the electives, uh, History 226, Ancient African History, and History 227, Ancient World History, none of which uh, though involved the study of ancient Egypt or, or of the ancient Middle East. Thanks to MTC uh, wonderful uh, staff and board, in fall 2021, my course on the history and art of ancient Egypt, History 280, was introduced in the humanities curriculum. And as far as I know, this has been the first time in the US that Egyptology entered the prison and was presented to incarcerated students. I designed the course similarly to an introduction course to Egyptology for undergraduate students. I used uh, Salima Ikram's Introduction to Ancient Egypt, one of the most popular textbooks used in uh, Egyptological courses for undergraduates. And it was the main uh, textbook, textbook, but I also provided uh, various um, articles in a reader. You can see on the slide uh, some titles of studies included in the syllabus, which introduce basic issues about ancient Egyptian history, archaeology, history of reception, art, literature, and also Nubian studies. Uh, so uh, um, the history, archaeology of ancient Sudan, which has been one of the favorite topics for a classroom that was mainly composed by African-American students. We also read some extracts from uh, Karakuni's book on Hatshepsut, to discuss widely the role of women in ancient Egypt. And um, did I wish to thank Kara for uh, donating 20 copies of it for our prison library. Uh, my colleague Ben Porter from uh, Middle Eastern Languages and Cultures has been also donating uh, books on uh, Middle Eastern archaeologists, and we are open for donations, of course. As for... Um, uh, okay. Right. As for most of the courses of the MTC programs, uh, History 280 could be supported by a TA, and I was lucky to have my own uh, back then a PhD student, Kia Johnston. She's now a lecturer for digital humanities here in Berkeley, uh, who has been tutoring the students, guiding them through the weekly assignments, which consisted in writing uh, one or two paragraphs commenting on the reading of the week, and answering prompts. And uh, here you see an example of those from uh, week 10 of the course, so pretty advanced already um, through the study of ancient Egypt. So for the class introducing the ancient Egyptian written culture, the prompt was imagine to be an ancient Egyptian scribe. How would you use your skills? What kind of text would you like to write and why? Or when talking about ancient Egyptian daily life, how do you think the geography and environment of a land influences its culture, society, and religion? I designed the prompts in a way that could simulate the students' imagination about how those ancient people lived and felt the world around them and how they produce knowledge. These prompts and, in general, the long class discussions were meant also to let them compare 
their own lived experience with the life experience of people living in a different time and society. And what we, I and Kia, uh, were not expecting, expecting is how deep the ancient Egyptian art, material culture and text would resonate among incarcerated students and how easily they could relate to the study material we were exposing them to. Here it is important also to note that due to COVID restrictions that have been in place until very recently in prison, the enrollment for each class was capped at 15. My class reached maximum enrollment with 11 out of 15 students being African-Americans. And it is well known how Blacks constitute the highest percentage of inmates in the US and in California, especially in male prisons. Black men comprise about 30% of the US population, but 35% of those incarcerated. And California, despite its reputation as a progressive state, is one of the epicenters of mass incar incarceration in the United States, incarcerating more people than any other state except Texas. African Americans remain overrepresented in California's prison population, and in recent data, 28.5% of the state male prisoners were African American, compared to just 5.6% of the state's adult male uh, residents. And the imprisonment rate for African American men is 4,236 per 100,000 people. Again, not super update um, um, date data, but more or less we are there. 10 times for imprisonment rate for white men, which is 422 per 100,000. The implication of teaching a class of mainly black students could be guessed considering that the real and or imagined world of the pharaohs has been revised in black America through a series of important philosophical, political, literary and artistic movements that have shaped black American life. What I have found among the black incarcerated students on my course was a multifaceted uh, um, uh, history of, of the reception of ancient Egypt, its social history, arts and religion that had roots within the African-American communities from the civil rights movement to the Black Lives Matter protest. And that showed how ideals of black power and of racial justice have been closely connected to the claim of ancient Egypt being part of black heritage. Most of these students were also believers, mainly Christians or Muslims. They definitely knew their Bible and were looking in discourse for discussion about the Exodus. As outlined in various studies, the book of Exodus is a powerful narrative of liberation that has been a central imaginative touchstone in the black American struggle against US racism and at the center of the writings of black thinkers as a fitting allegory for the painful experience of exile and the African diaspora. In these narratives, Pharaoh can alternatively be seen as a tyrant who enslaved the Israelites or as the glorious royal ancestor of their original lost civilization. Uh, Martin Luther King said in one of his speeches, whenever Pharaoh wanted to prolong the period of slavery in Egypt, he had the favorite, favorite formula for doing it. He kept the slaves fighting among themselves. But whenever the slaves get together, something happens in Pharaoh's court and he cannot hold the slaves in slavery. When the slaves get together, that's the beginning of the getting out, out of slavery. And I'm quoting this passage since this was the kind of perception and receptions of ancient Egypt in the classroom, even among the non-black minority of the students. I think my uh, TA's Kias Johnson's feedback uh, on this course, which she kindly offered to share for this paper, uh, is a powerful and explicative example of the kind of conversation we were having in class and therefore worth to read in full. And so I'm quoting Kia here. Teaching about ancient Egypt at San Quentin was both eye-opening and rewarding. When I volunteered to be Rita Lucarelli's teaching assistant, I was close to graduating with my doctorate. 
I volunteered because I felt that I live in a little bit of an enclave at Berkeley, and I felt that I wasn't really contributing to making my community a better place. And this was a good opportunity to do it. It was also outside of my comfort zone. My job involved substituting for Rita and also leading a weekly study hall where students would come in to talk, work on homework, or to ask questions. I had never worked in a prison before. I didn't know what to expect. Teaching students at San Quentin was much different than teaching undergraduates. While I usually have to tease questions out of my undergraduates, the students at San Quentin were very interested in learning, did the assigned reading, and almost always had questions and comments. Many of the questions related the, the material um, to their own experience. These connections were sometimes surprising to me, but also really caused me to think. For example, in a discussion on the economy of ancient Egypt, I mentioned that most farmers didn't own the land that they worked, which instead belonged to the state of the temp or the temple. Farmers paid a large percentage of their crops upward through a series of middlemen, with most of the produce ending up with the temple or state and being redistributed to priests and administrators. One of my students exclaimed, that's sharecropping, we know all about sharecropping. Several others in the class chuckled. This is a connection I'd never made, but it was one that was obvious, obvious to my mostly black students. When reflecting on this remark, and also on what the students told me about working for petty change in the prison industries workshop, it was one of several moments I had in that class where the recent and ancient past both seems uncomfortable, un uncomfortably close to the present. This sense of closeness to the past can be disturbing, but also comforting. Several of my students were artists who worked Egyptian themes into their art. These students find a sense of identity in the idea that ancient Egypt was a great African culture when the generation of black Americans had been told that there were no great African cultures. Other students were looking for a connection between ancient Egypt and their religious beliefs. I had to tread somewhat carefully in discussion of the historicity of the story of Exodus. To my knowledge, there is no evidence of a historical Moses or of a dramatical escape across the Red Sea. There are narratives of small numbers of enslaved people who escaped the Egyptians. I tried to be honest about the scope of our knowledge in a way that was respectful to a faith that plays an important part, important part in the lives of the students who were asking the questions. Some students get more immediate benefit from the class. I had one student who would come to study to the study hall and sleep. He told me his new cellmate was mentally unstable and that he didn't go to sleep at night until he heard the other guy snoring because he was afraid he might get stabbed. Even if knowing about ancient Egypt didn't add anything permanent to the lives of my students, the ability to come to class, to be mentally stimulated, to talk and to feel temporarily safe certainly did. To me, being able to make a small difference in their lives in the lives of my students was the bottom line that made the class worth it. Now I have to thank Kia. She cannot be here today for this uh, thoughtful feedback. She's still volunteering for the program and helping the students in the new computer lab that uh, they just uh, got and they're very happy about it. I decided to call this uh, paper Teaching Math, referring to the main ancient Egyptian idea of uh, what is right. Uh, personificated by a beautiful winged goddess. And uh, this is going to be also the title of a, a more extensive publication I'm preparing. Uh, because in fact, the study of ancient Egyptian religion and ethics and the way they influence the reception of this ancient culture among my incarcerated students is what has made my experience about teaching Egyptology in prison really unique. The challenge within this cultural setting and while dealing with reception has been to be able to present a rigorous academic view of ancient Egypt, its culture and society to a student population whose personal experience in, experience in prison as well as the memory of their life outside the carceral space makes most of the teaching material very sensitive, especially when dealing with religious beliefs, ethics, wisdom literature, 
the idea of math is itself what is right versus what is punishment in this and in the other world. Ancient Egyptian religion, the way it shaped the Egyptian worldview and daily life, the conception of the divine, the belief in life after death on earth has been, have been the topics the students wanted to discuss the most. I do not think I ever spent uh, so much time in any other course at UC Berkeley on uh, the scene you see, in, he, you see here on the slide, uh, the final judgment uh, uh, of the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead, as I did in my St. Quentin class of Egyptology. The students wanted to know every detail on the scenes and carefully attempted an interpretation of the full text of spell, so-called spell 125 of the Book of the Dead and the so-called the negative confession in which the deceased has to say that he did not sin, he did not commit any sin. One of the students proudly told me that he hanged the color picture that you see here from the famous Papyrus of Ani uh, in the British Museum, that, which I distributed in class, uh, in his cell as a reminder that justice will be established eventually. Many of them are uh, lifers waiting to be paroled. And um, he even invited me, by the way, to go visit his uh, decorated cell walls. But of course, I could not do that. At the beginning, um, I was also concerned that they would overinterpret the sources, transform Egyptology in a religious teaching. After a few classes and a lot of discussions about the ancient Egyptian religion, I was, uh, however, reassured that they were more interested to learn about my view of ancient Egypt and a truly fun to challenging their own. They were listening, reading, making questions in order to learn and not for finding confirmation of their own ideas about what justice on earth and in the netherworld is in the ancient Egyptian worldview. I had to make sure they understood the difference between primary and secondary sources and that Baj, which is a famous uh, author in Egyptology, uh, from uh, 1920, who published facsimiles of the Book of the Dead. Uh, I had to make sure Badge was, they understood Badge was a secondary source and not the author of the Book of the Dead. And here you can see one of the assignments response about uh, becoming an Egyptology, uh, Egyptologist, what kind of sources, methodol methodologies you would use as an Egyptologist. And so the answer, if I was, to become an Egyptologist, first I would want to learn about the text. I've always been very interested in studying hieroglyphs, hieroglyphics, should be hieroglyphs. Uh, and Wallace Budge's Book of the Dead is a famous book. I'm very intrigued uh, about Egyptian text and history, and I pray that I can be introduced to a new world of thought by my new Egyptian instructor. I'm not Egyptian, but you know, it's nice uh, to read that. The incarcerated population is also plenty of amazing artists and prison art is finally being recognized also in public spaces. For instance, at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, where a virtual exhibition of prison art, including the work of some of my students, was hosted already back in 2020. Egypt has been greatly uh, represented and here I like to mention two of my students who enrolled in my course, especially in order to find further inspiration for their art. And so Gerald Morgan, who is finally aptly paroled after serving more than half of his life sentence. And as instructor, I was able to help the process with the recommendation letter for a parole board. And this is another really important function of teaching in prison. You can actually help them through their uh, access to um, parole board. His painting wants to honor uh, its African heritage, struggles and futures, and you can see Egyptian uh, uh, symbols and ima imagery here as well. Lamavi's short com um, Commando Villa, whose work has been defined by art critics as uh, Afrofuturism, uh, through the fusion of pointillism and expressionism um, uh, with the dash of African symbolism that you can see in his uh, a life-size uh, piece, The Feminine Yakub of 2042, which depicts all-seeing eyes, pyramids, circles, and cube shapes that are strategically placed around three African queens in full tribal dress, while uh, 
in the other uh, um, painting, Amani Candice, he depicted uh, a fierce and warrior-like queen of Nubia. And in class, he wanted to talk all the time about queenship in ancient Egypt, Nubian women, Nubian queens defending the kingdom from Rome. Some of, the, of my Egyptology students have, uh, have successfully graduated uh, uh, two summers ago now, and I wanted to show you these beautiful pictures from graduation, despite COVID, despite having to learn to prison quarantines, and with no possibility to use internet. And in fact, this was another uh, challenge of teaching in prison, the impossibility to even use a PowerPoint or uh, uh, internet links to academic websites. The only tool is the whiteboard. And so you can see them uh, here proud of something they achieved uh, through uh, real work and dedication. So what is the lesson we can learn from it uh, as scholars of the ancient world? How does the ancient past create meaning for the present of uh, incarcerated people of, uh, in the US and abroad? Mm -hmm. I like to let two uh, alumni of the MTC program to speak for me. Emil De Weaver uh, is a black community organizer literary writer and journalist who co-founded the Pri Prison Renaissance Org while uh, serving 67 years to life sentence in prison. His sentence was then commuted in 2017 uh, thanks to his community service, productivity, and his story of transformation after having graduated uh, at the MTC program. And so he said, uh, and this is uh, from the website of the program, so you can go back to the website if you want to hear more about alumni. Uh, if I can teach generations to write with the consciousness that their work can heal our world and they teach generation after them, the legacy continues. And uh, Eddie Arena, also the staff photographer for the only inmate run newspaper in California, San Quentin News, which I invite you also to check online. And uh, we have a, a UC Berkeley professor, Bill Drummond, who's been also a mentor for me in teaching in prison, who, uh, uh, keep um, teaching a course on uh, San Quentin News. So UC Berkeley uh, students can actually go in prison and work with uh, journalist inmates. Um, and so he said, uh, um, a liberal arts education is a window into the beauty, struggle, and cruelty of humanity's will to endure. Through it, we can strive to be and do better. We can learn what it means to uphold and respect the beliefs of others, no matter how different or contrary they are to our own. And that's indeed what I found out while teaching uh, to those students. And these words also bring us back to the ancient Egyptian wisdom literature and the praises of knowledge and education that one can read, for instance, in the instructions of Ani, one of the favorite texts also of my students. One will do all you say if you are versed in writings, study the writings, put them in your heart, then all your words will be effective. Whatever office a scribe is given, he should consult the writings. Egyptology with, it, with its, in, its incredible uh, various and fascinating primary sources, cultural entanglements and changes through the millennia that one needs to understand while consuming centuries of scholarship covering so many subdisciplines from archeology span to philology, of anthropology and science is definitely a field that can be renewed if taught in a prison environment, especially today when we are continuously discussing how to rebrand, diversify, and decolonize a discipline that together with Greek and Roman studies has been used for centuries to support colonialist projects. It is not the case that, um, and I'll show you this video later, but... It's not a case that uh, classics is now also being taught in prison and the pedagogies used in prison settings are being discussed in scholarly conferences and the recent publication you see here on the slide has collected them. Engaging with ancient Egypt in prison and as instructor, make sure they engage with it in a safe and stimulating learning environment where the incarcerated students are reminded and, and reassured that uh, even behind bars, they can contribute to humanity, could be one of the new frontiers of our disciplines, archaeology and Egyptology. 
In his book, Teaching to Transgress, Bell Hooks wrote, the classroom with all its limitations remains a location of possibility in which we have the opportunity to labor for freedom, to face reality, even if we collectively imagine ways to move beyond boundaries, to transgress. This is education as the practice of freedom. And so to let incarcerated students move beyond the physical boundaries of the prison setting and be transported in a world ruled by math is probably the minimum contribution we could make as scholars, as Egyptologists, and as humans lucky enough to live outside those bars. So I hope with this lecture to maybe stimulate uh, students or other faculty to join the program as volunteers, or you can also uh, make a good small donation um, or get in touch with me for more information. I don't know how we are with time. I had the small videos uh, yeah, from uh, um, San Quentin News, uh, um, kindly uh, shared by Bill Drummond. And many of the students of the course are also part of the, are actually oops, journalists uh, in the program. So just, uh, you can have here a glimpse of the educational building and the uh, San Quentin Hi. News. Uh, my name is Arnulfo Garcia. I'm the uh, chief of the San Quentin newspaper. The where they work. Our entire staff of 15 inmates, reporters, six oh. community volunteers, the graduate students of UC Berkeley Journalism and Business School is honored to be nominated okay, well, and receive this important award. At the time San anyway, Quentin News received the James questions. Madison Award, our staff and free world the volunteers were did, uh, working tirelessly work, uh, and how they in providing the public with a unique uh, journalistic, journalistic work, perspective uh, so they really can make informed decisions connected also about to the humanities policies. program. In the San Quint New staff and, uh, takes our program, journalistic uh, responsibility very, very um, seriously. We aspire to remove the curtain of secrecy that so often shrouds in darkness. Not only uh, at well, San Quentin, anyway, we'll but also in give you an idea throughout the nation's the criminal setting. justice system. Thank Remember, you so much. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Have you taught this class, and do you have um, you have new students every time, or do you have students that come back again and again if you've taught it more than once, so that they kind of dive in deeper and really? Yeah. So now I'm hoping to uh, teach it again soon. It's an elective, so uh, the program is not too big. They don't have space for many electives, and they try to alternate. Uh, so they are offering now other uh, other courses. Uh, but I, I kept teaching, uh, for instance, the last semester, a course on comparative religion. And this semester, um, tutoring for writing and uh, um, co-teaching uh, for a course on literature, where, of course, I talk about ancient literature and so on. And there are some returning students, and uh, I could note how they really wanted to continue to know more about uh, the ancient world. That was really, um, uh, really great to to see how they they really they were really curious. Although it's let's say as a field, it's something that will not help them to get a job when they get out, unless oh no, they they really they're really lucky, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned the the work of it, like the graduate student that was helping you as a teacher's assistant. What role can undergraduates play in in this program? Like, are there opportunities for us to get involved, or is that something where we need to graduate first? Oh no, no. Um, the volunteer program is open for applications every semester, mm -hmm. and you don't have to be uh, enrolled, not even at university. Some of the instructors are uh, uh, school teachers or um, uh, anyone interested could, uh, could, could contribute. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, you will have sort of interview and they will see what is your specialty and if you will be able to teach. And there is then uh, a series of workshops uh, uh, as a training to, mm -hmm. to learn all the rules. There are a lot of rules. I 
another question. <laughs> Thank you. Could you say something about Maat, M-A-A-T, which is obviously an important concept in the Egyptian worldview or in the past Egyptian culture, sure. if you will, and how you obviously used it because they seem to engage with it and how you've talked about other things, um, but how they engage with that concept, that Egyptian Yeah, concept. thank you for this question. Indeed, in my larger publication on this project uh, that is basically on reception of ancient Egypt uh, uh, in um, uh, modern uh, and contemporary America, uh, Black America, actually, more in particular. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting because uh, math in ancient Egypt is indeed what is right for the Egyptians, which is different than what we consider right. Right, so it's all uh, connected to their ethics. And uh, so with the students, we were discussing a lot how some kind of violence in ancient Egypt is math, if it's the pharaoh defending the land as meshing uh, the enemies, then killing is what is right, is math. So math is one of these personifications of justice, which is cosmic justice, but it's also social justice, and is really embedded in the ancient Egyptian worldview. And so it was really interesting to discuss how it's important to understand what math was in ancient Egypt from an emic point of view, from the ancient Egyptian point of view, but that does not mean that we should uh, honor math uh, in the same way, right? And, that, and so we, we talk a lot about comparative uh, uh, views on society and the violence and punishment. Of course, being them for them uh, was very interesting to understand uh, how uh, justice connect to punishment and if punishment is wrong, when is wrong, why, and uh, how ancient cultures teach us some lessons about who to punish, when. So it, it was really, um, as I said, um, very complex in a sense to discuss these topics with them because they were always really related, uh, um, relating uh, the, the course material to their own experience. Uh, of course, I try also to, to show how those, um, in ancient Egypt, uh, uh, gods are personifications of important concepts many times. So, math, uh, also chaos is represented by another goddess, god, male god. Math is the female goddess. So, why also the questions why justice is female and uh, chaos is male, for instance, mm -hmm. right? And so, well, there are also female deities who are very chaotic and angry and dangerous, right? Yeah. So they, then they wanted to know more about Sakmet, the lion goddesses who, who send demons on earth to kill everyone when she's upset and things like that. So but it's, um, I think the ancient Egyptian religion is um, it's attractive for them also because it's really easy to visualize. We have so many visuals. Uh, when I've been teaching them the course of comparative religion, for instance, they had they were really struggling sometimes to to, to talk understand concepts of Buddhism or uh, Hinduism, or Hinduism. Hinduism uh, without many visuals explaining uh, more philosophical concepts. So that was uh, really challenging. Also, to find honestly a textbook to use. <laughs> for comparative religion, uh, since all was had to be in the textbook, I could not use anything from the internet or uh, I could not bring a PowerPoint class. So that was challenging. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Could you say a little bit more about Mount Tamalpais College? Is it a local accredited institution or is it all inside the prison? Yeah, yeah, it's been uh, recently accredited. Um, and it grew a lot. It's the ex. Uh, it was called uh, uh, prison uh, um, prison project or something like that. Um, and then became Mount Tamalpais uh, College. And uh, I think we owe really to the vision of the president uh, Jody Yu and uh, the way it uh, it has been growing uh, with uh, more uh, staff, uh, faculty, volunteers. All the faculty are volunteers, although uh, right now they're 
they're trying to help us at least, for instance, students, volunteers who need transportation. One of the problems is that you need to drive there. There's not really public transportation available. Um, and so it could be even sort of expensive to go there and, and teach and cross the bridge all the time. But they're, they're really accommodating also the volunteers need. Um, and um, right now they are expanding with a series of other programs in collaboration with other educational programs in St. Quentin. It's not the only educational programs. There are events. I was hoping eventually to organize a conference there, inviting uh, colleagues from UC Berkeley who would like to come and give a lecture on what they do. Um, so it's, um, it's a program which is growing and uh, it's, um, keeps growing and uh, uh, providing new opportunities to the incarcerated people. Um, I've been pretty content of uh, until now to teach for them. Mm -hmm. And in terms of donating books, um, I was donating some books at Moe's, a special place for the prison library project. Yeah, so and, they, they yeah. have, um, um, we have the, an, our own library accessible to the students and now also mm -hmm. comp a computer lab and they have a small uh, iPads, uh, the students now that they can mm -hmm. use with the limited ac access Mm -hmm. to internet. Uh, at, at the moment, we are at full capacity. It's not a big library. At a certain point, we had too many donations and there was no space for new mm -hmm. books. Uh, I wish we could have more books of archaeology because as I showed, the, the humanities program, program is mostly on modern histories, uh, American history, Californian history, um, I mean, modern Californian history, but there's not much of archaeology. So now there's something about from ancient Egypt, uh, but it would be great to have more archaeological publications, of course, eventually, as soon as we make some room for it. Yeah, thank you. Right, I know that there's, there's so many books that could be available. Yeah, there, there were certain groups of book types of books they really wanted. I think dictionaries, sociology. Books, well, there should be, all. of course, books, um, more introductory books, as for undergraduates, because um, of course there are no specialized specialized students there. Mm -hmm. So general introductions, for instance, with lots of nice images. They, they mm -hmm. really enjoyed that those visuals, you know, to see visuals, that's great. Also journal, journal series. So Ben Porter, for instance, gave me, um, I still have to work on it, but biblical archeology, span some uh, series of uh, biblical archeology, span which is another topic that indeed interests them a lot because um, religion uh, plays a big role there. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.